Greetings, I'm Dina Caparelli. Thank you for joining me for my talk, Desert Skies to Gardens of Delight, Landscapes Real and Imagined in the 21st Century. We're looking at an image of my studio that has some paintings in progress that you might be able to see in a future exhibition titled Furious Gardens at the Claremont Museum of Art. It's planned to run from September 3rd through November 28th, COVID forgiving. I hope to meet some of you then. Now, before I get started on the talk, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up locally in Rancho Cucamonga. I did my graduate work at Claremont Graduate University in the 80s. My home base and studio is in Pasadena, and I'm a full-time professor of art at Pasadena City College. I do have a long history of exhibiting drawings, paintings, sculptures, sculpture installations, as well as uh, working in uh, interdisciplinary artist collectives, which I have co-coordinated. And those combine art, geography, and science. One of the projects is a seven-year long-term interdisciplinary land-specific project titled Moisture. I will start my talk by narrating a short animation that I made that discusses this project. Moisture is an experimental research project undertaken by a Los Angeles-based artist collective focused on developing location-sensitive structures for the collection, retention, and use and reuse of water in the Mojave Desert. The collective are invested in creating microclimates within one of the driest desert regions on the planet. Our collective was inspired to expand on our grand schemes and experiments. So we embarked on a six month land search with Matt Coolidge of the Center for Land Use Interpretation as our land purchase partner. Our focus was on the area surrounding Hinkley, an area made famous by Aaron Brockovich regarding chromium six leaks from the local PG&E power plant. The land search was one of the most powerful desert culture learning experiences we could have hoped for and helped shape our approach to this project. Moisture was funded from the LEF Foundation the Beale Center for Art and Technology, and Rainbird to research their project dry water. As we began to develop our plans for the moisture site, we had a number of conversations with a region expert hydrologist, Paul Measleys. Based from what he advised, we decided on our water collection and diversion system. We built a gabion that diverted whatever rain water that moved through a small wash on the property to a underground cistern that could then be passed to garden number two of our seven Little Dipper gardens. Garden number one received water directly diverted to it from the Gabion. The cistern. All the members of Moisture worked breaking through several feet of hard pan to dig to the proper slopes and levels to set the drains, pipes, and the cistern. We lovingly titled garden number two, Bernard's Ball Breaker, after member Bernard Perrault's impressive determination to get through the cliche and make sure our calculations for the system were met. There are seven gardens positioned in the pattern and under the Little Dipper. Each are circles mimicking the natural circle patterns found throughout the Mojave, sometimes called fairy circles. Each garden has a five foot radius, the same dimensions of the cattle cisterns that are positioned on the edge of our 15 acre site. We liked the idea that the gardens would blend into the natural patterns of the Mojave terrain and be visible only from the sky. Gardens were planted with native seeds to the region and surrounded by plantings of indigenous trees.
Our project began in the middle of one of the biggest droughts on record. We used telemetry to monitor the moisture levels of the soil remotely from Los Angeles. We were very aware of how little moisture was actually in the gardens. Artists came out to work with us at the sites to water, clean up, and plant. After losing lots of plant material due to high winds and hungry animals, we built cages with wind protection around the trees. Our preparation of the soil was intended not only to host more plant variation, but to stimulate existing seeds sleeping in the soil. On the whole, we tried to design levels in the garden that promoted healthy growth areas for other vegetation to thrive on. The conditions at the site are extreme. Air temperatures reach over 120 in the summer and below 14 in the winter. Seasonal winds blow around 30 miles per hour, and the wind blows every day. Average rainfall is 5 inches. Oftentimes, it's between 0 and 2. In 2005, it reached an all-time high of 15 inches. We worked with Rainbird to test their product dry water in the Mojave, since it's one of the more extreme conditions in the world. Dry water is 98% water. The rest is cellulose gum and aluminum that breaks down over the course of a month that allows the plant to have a slow feed at the root ball. Animals and insects love dry water too. They devoured it as well as 80% of the planted material that first summer. Replanting the site. We were put in touch with a seed bank that had seeds native to our region in the Mojave we decided to propagate and grow the trees and shrubs from our Los Angeles location, then transplant on the site. Learning from the summer of 2004, we caged the roots and now made cages using chicken wire and dried salt bush to fully protect and camouflage the young trees. Dry water allowed plants to survive, but to thrive we needed monthly supplements of water and we need to give the seedlings nutrient boosts. Years of grazing cows in the Mojave changed the alkaline levels of the soil, so we chose plants that not only provided food for animals and humans, but would amend the soil to help a wider variety of plants once again grow at the site. Our biggest rainfall was in 2005, which yielded our greatest growth of plants. We had our largest interest and visitors to our site, which included biologists who discovered scat of mountain lions, bobcat, coyote, jackrabbit, skeletal remains of tortoise, and other nocturnal animals. We had interdisciplinary art historians with geographers, artists, and of course visitors from Hinkley as they spotted the reflections of our cars on the site. You are never more visible than when you think you are invisible. Every monthly visit included flyovers by military planes that circled and buzzed us as we worked the gardens. The year 2007 was a very dry year. Ground burrowing animals went after the roots of whatever uncaged root balls from trees and shrubs were in the gardens. Students, artists, and academics visited the site that year, along with predatory animals, leaving the carcass of a jackrabbit just as we arrived at the site. The Mojave is an interesting land configuration. It appears to be flat, but actually it's built up of big berms and then drops and dips into small arroyos that can camouflage and cover the height of a coyote, a mountain lion, or a small human. 2008 key members Bernard Peru and Adam Belt had moved on to other projects. 
co-coordinators Claude Willey and Dina Caparelli, along with Mark Sang, continue to monitor and maintain the site. There was enough rain to stimulate growth of our plantings, along with other surprise arrivals. We found a new tortoise burrow, along with a tortoise, on the site. Evidence of multiple animal and insect activity on the site as well. We were never upset. In fact, we were happy to feed the inhabitants of the land through our gardens if they just would wait until the trees could survive the summer feasting events. That would have been our preference. An F-22 plane crashes a half mile from the site and we need military clearance along with officials to observe our activities at moisture. While the military cleaned up the desert of all traces of the F-22 and finished their investigations, those who monitored us thought we were truly crazy. This was the last year we actively maintained the gardens. Six years commitment to the land and project yielded gardens that truly integrated into the desert landscape and with great effort disappeared into the history of the Mojave Desert. For the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the comparisons and contrast between the Land Art Project Moisture and my paintings. In 2012, I was able to take an academic sabbatical. Uh, I went to England to look at stone cirques and, uh, and mounds, and I was comparing them with indigenous sites in the Midwest and East Coast of the United States. During my drive across the country for my U.S. leg of the sabbatical, I decided to visit garden, the garden estates of our founding fathers, and I was particularly struck with George Washington's estate in Mount Vernon, where he really reshaped that whole hill uh, to curate for visitors um, an inspired journey to showcase the beauty of all this country had to offer. That large-scale land manipulation was really similar to 18th century landscapes of William Kent and Lancelot Brown that I had visited a few years earlier in England. One of the things that I uh, was really struck about these uh, landscape designs and manipulations is that they were designed to look like Italian landscape paintings. And then there's this whole cycle. So there's the Italian landscape painting that ins uh, landscapes that inspired the paintings that inspired the uh, English architects to design landscapes to look like the paintings. And then of course that inspires artists to paint from those landscape paintings. But more important than that, I think one of the things that was uh, that really spoke to me was that the uh, the landscape designs were really constructed, curated journeys for visitors of the estates to uh, participate in. So I was able to go back uh, in 2016, another sabbatical in 2019, thinking that I was going to do a project that was either with another collective or a book. Actually, a book was sort of in my mind, but the reality is I started to make paintings. And um, now you're going to see the result of all of those uh, trips. These paintings are inspired from walks in the landscape. I try to keep myself present in the experience that stimulates my mind, body, and spirit. In the walks, I am interested in how the land has been shaped and curated for the visitor. The manipulation of the terrain, configurations of colors, the sounds, the smells, the cadence of movement make for the best journeys. Back in my studio, I think about how can I capture some of that experience from the walk and put it into my paintings. There are a number of ways that I like to reflect back on a journey. Uh, one is 
through photographs I take. I do use a camera, but once I have sort of inspired my thought process through photographs, I try to set the photographs aside and let my intuition guide the rest of the painting process. I feel like through the painting, I am able to create a completely new encounter with some of the elements of the landscape that I had, that I experienced on my walks. So for this particular painting, I'm really playing with a color palette of blue and pink. There is a bit of a portal to the left-hand side where a pathway leads you to this sort of mysterious glowing area. And then there's another sort of portal to the right that reveals this sort of dripping tree trunk. I like to combine different styles together. This has a very kind of playful, almost, you know, f uh, flat graphic, graphic kind of quality. And then it has some more rendered qualities, some atmospheric qualities. And I like to sort of fuse them together to uh, e explore a kind of visual spectacle if you will, uh, in my paintings. When I was on my sabbatical in 2012, I was walking a lot of landscape in England and many of that was in the rain and it was sort of sloshy and muddy and you were seeing through the mist, uh, there was new growth, it was vibrant. And when I sat down to make this painting, I was thinking about that experience. I was using these horizontal, I'm sorry, these vertical sort of bands that go from a translucent to an opaque kind of glowing color that reminded me a little bit of the experience of trying to see through the mist and see through the rain of the landscape. I make up most of the plant material. It's, it's not rooted in something that's real. And I fuse it with things that are rendered uh, or plant materials that, that's, that's rendered that we might recognize. In this case, it was um, these daffodils. And in the beginning of spring, it seemed that most fields were uh, flooded with daffodils flooded with water and daffodils. And um, so I incorporated them into this painting. When I started this body of work, I decided to make up a system of rules for the paintings. The paintings had to be playful. I wanted to be free uh, to combine different painterly styles, textures, uh, marks, glazes, whatever I could think of in a single work. Each of these paintings are 36 by 48 inches. And I thought I would talk to you about how I uh, construct the work. I usually begin with determining where a horizon line might be and deciding on the color for that area of that ground area in the upper area above the horizon line. Next, I design a pathway either in this black puce color or vibrant green, and I lay those areas out. From there, I start building the elements of the landscape. I work from the background and eventually move my way forward. I try to make up or determine what's going to happen next after I have finished one element that's furthest in that background. The end result are these kind of very strange sort of surreal feeling landscapes. They're, they're rather otherworldly. So I wanted to also talk about the, the function of these black areas or these puce areas. They function as water, as fertile soil, as voids, and it can be interchangeable to any one of those elements. The painting on the right, 
I included these horizontal bars that cut through elements of the landscape. You'll see in the top, or le top uh, left of the right-hand painting, there are these sort of crystal-like, monolithic stone sculptures that tra traverse to the background, to that horizon line. And then there is this horizontal break that cuts through the tree leading through the, the monolithic shape, and then it bends behind another tree-like form. I kind of look at those breaks as if the painting is being cut through and you're seeing behind the painting, and behind the painting there's maybe sky, although some of the areas of these horizontal breaks, they become translucent and you see almost like you see sort of the ghost image of, you know, what that bar was breaking through, whether it is the stem of a tulip on the lower right-hand side or parts of the uh, sculptural monolithic stone shapes that are in the background in the upper left-hand side of the painting. Another challenge I set up for these paintings is that I wanted the paintings to have this sense that it was very still and quiet while at the same time it was it would shock your eye with color and textures um, and i i did that by rotating layers of cool to warm colors as as you work your way from the foreground all the way through to the background this particular painting was inspired by a walk i had where I was walking on the edge of a great hunting park and a manor that was connected to an estate that was, oh, maybe, I don't know, 100 acres from this spot. And there was this little area between the two that had been left to the wild. It was chaotic and wonderful all at the same time. It didn't have any of the manicured qualities of the great hunting parks or the, um, the uh, thoughtful qualities of a pleasure garden that was associated with the manor. It was an in-between state. And I love those mysterious spaces. So this painting was inspired by that experience. And I started off very differently with this one. I started off using uh, a very kind of abstract gestural painting that really didn't have much form. It was just color, and you can see it's mostly in horizontal bands. The left-hand side was darker, kind of crossing over to a lighter side on the right-hand side. And then once that um, was laid out, I started applying the... Uh, elements of the landscape that I wanted to uh, create this uh, particular kind of visual journey. Uh, so I uh, added all of these kind of delicate linear forms that are suggestive of deciduous shrubs, trees, or grass, however you want to look at it. Um, and a lot of references to the way that maybe uh, Indian miniature paintings have been uh, influencing me uh, historically throughout my career in drawings and uh, paintings. Uh, on the left-hand side, we're looking at sort of a portal into this darkness, and you see these little red dots back there. Those red dots start to read a bit like flowers or maybe eyeballs, and then there are these kind of bands of light in front of that kind of uh, that help lead you to that dark space and on the right hand side we have these uh, archways of more lush plant-like material um, almost like a firework of flowers sort of wrapping around it leading you to this space that is more luminous and possibly more inviting this painting is 40 by 60 inches, and I completed it in 2020. 
Um, this one, I am sort of looking back at the traditional compositional structure of the picturesque landscape. And I was thinking it would be fun to use that structure in a much more playful manner. So I developed marks for each entity of the landscape so that the stroke or the tool applying the paint is suggesting the wide variety of uh, plant material, textures, surfaces, atmospheric qualities that you might find in the experience of this picturesque landscape. I really had a lot of fun with this one. Uh, this one also has that horizontal cut right at the horizon line. That horizontal cut is reflective of the sky. Um, there are also the, these uh, bands of, uh, you know, vertical light that stand in front of what is suggested as trees. Uh, for this, I was thinking a lot about a lot of the research that has come forward in recent years about how trees are able to communicate with each other through these almost like, uh, you know, these uh, fibrous elements of their root systems uh, in their kind of familial uh, strands uh, or um, thickets of, of, um, of growth. And they uh, can heal one another. They uh, um, support new growth saplings. Anyway, it's just, it's a, it's a really kind of extraordinary thing that, that we've been able to, or scientists have been able to, uh, to discover. So those bands sort of read like, you know, energy, communication, maybe growth. Um, on the, and on the right hand side is some of the more uh, playful moments where I was exploring kind of combining kind of the grotesque and ugly against what we might associate with beauty. You will see there's this kind of, uh, diagonal that runs <clears throat> across the lower right hand corner. There is this kind of goopy, drippy, vibrant colored uh, form that, that suggests some kind of colorful shrub. And then right behind, right below that are these more rendered flowers that are more suggestive of what an azalea would look like, except they're rendered in black. Um, that was sort of another kind of thing that I was, I was interested in was allowing things that are beautiful and brilliant in color to kind of be constructed out of this, out of this darkness. So I know I put plenty of ambiguous elements in my paintings, but I'm happy to have the paintings perceived in any way the viewer desires. The journey I take you on is not a tightly dictated one. Oftentimes I think about putting animals, birds, or insects in my paintings, but then I realize I really want the plants, the stones, the earth to be the heroes of the work. I like to think I'm making work that falls into the traditions of the sublime in, in nature, where we're looking at, or we're, you know, we're experiencing beauty and maybe a little bit of fear or apprehension all at the same time. When I actually walk a landscape, it's a lot like falling in love. If everything is just right, we feel that beautiful sense of awe. And some of the paintings I try to create, I try to create this moment to gasp at the intensity of the color or forms. And I do try to make them beautiful and maybe, you know, a little bit mysterious or frightening all at the same time. This is actually one of my favorite paintings. I really enjoy the way the pink sky and these fleshy pink trees 
play back and forth or have a kind of dialogue with one another, it also creates this sense of kind of chill in the air. At the same time, there are these forms behind the pink trees that look like shrubs that could be on fire, or maybe it is fire. All of that is moving or shifting on this really beautiful, vibrant green path to this very deep background space. I often think that I'm making paintings that are much like Elysian fields. And this is one of those paintings. It's a place that maybe I want to put my soul or rest my body when I'm no longer here. And certainly a place I might want to put my loved ones. This painting was completed in 2020 and is 30 by 40 inches. It is also oil on canvas. This is not a diptych. These are just two paintings that I've placed side by side. I call them my COVID paintings. These are places that I decided I wanted to make that I could visit while we were housebound during our world pandemic. In both of these paintings, I focused on making very soft midground, particularly in the right painting. Um, I placed the viewer in this meadow, and you're looking across a reflective water to this really soft, sinking midground area. The midground area then leads to these uh, very simplified, almost cartoon like. Um, shapes that would be a completely different kind of experience than the experience I have painted in the foreground. On the left hand side, there is another reflective body of water leading to very simple kind of abstract shapes, but basically the landscape does end in that mid-ground horizon plane. The foreground in this one has much more uh, variety of contrast of textures, um, surface tensions, um, relationships between a highly rendered botanical material and completely made up kind of odd shapes that might suggest elements uh, or, or other entities of the landscape. I'm ending my talk with this last painting that was completed in 2020. Um, in this piece, I am mixing up uh, elements of the landscape into unusual places or positions. There is this blue tree that is also very sky or cloud-like that is in the upper left-hand corner and a shrub that is also quite cloud-like. It's a kind of a green, yellow, um, kind of sickly, maybe looking death cloud that is sitting on top of or behind uh, a row of uh, painterly marks that might suggest some kind of vibrant red uh, flowering shrub or a uh, rock-like formation. I really enjoy experimenting and coming up with a brush stroke or brush mark that is highly suggestive of a certain kind of textural quality or um, form that we might experience in the landscape. This last piece um, also has what I call areas of wounds. And uh, there is a kind of a fleshy, kind of raw wound looking uh, orange shape that is right behind the foregrounded azaleas on the lower left hand side that um, I start to repeat also in um, on the right hand side, but it's taking a little bit more of a flower form. Uh, there's always so much relationship between the body and all other living uh, elements on this earth. 
that I had to incorporate this idea of the wound and also these kind of uh, black puce shapes become a little bit like they are voids or holes that are uh, dug out for potentially a coffin or a grave. I guess that's quite morbid. Of course, it doesn't have to be read that way. It could be just read as a spectacle of, of vibrant color and joy and um, delight. I want to thank you for inviting me to uh, present my work to you and for coming along on my visual journey through paintings. <laughs>